Welcome everybody to the Parallel Programming Concepts course in OpenHPI. This is the second week and we are in the first unit called Parallelism and Concurrency. My name is Peter Trüger. Last week we um, discussed several topics that relate to the understanding of parallel hardware systems. Um, we started with Moore's Law and the Powerwall in order to understand why today a lot of new parallel systems have additional cores, additional processing elements available for uh, being used. And um, it turned out last week that the main thing to speed up software today is to use the additionally offered processing elements in hardware in order to increase your application speed. Um, the second thing we discussed last week was the ILP wall and the memory wall. So we um, identified the problem that memory access is an issue in speeding up your application. So you need to consider this in your programming models and in the design of your application. The third thing we talked about was the classification of parallel hardware according, for example, to Flint's taxonomy, but also on the other hand, according to the memory architecture that is built into these systems. And we finalized the last week with um, a discussion of Amdahl's law and Gustafsson's law, which tell us um, how speed up and scaled speed up can be defined um, in relation to how the particular parallel program is designed. So in this second week, we will continue from this point by taking a different view on the same problem. So we take the hardware view we got in the last week with the different kind of processing elements, either attached to a shared memory or um, working in a shared nothing environment. And now we start to ask ourselves, what is the software perspective on such a system? Um, the software perspective basically means that we start from the operating system as the lowest level of software we run on a system and then we step by step go through the different layers um, like the middleware or the um, application logic and ask ourselves how can parallel hardware be exploited on these layers in order to gather some speed up. In order to do a real investigation of the relevant concepts, we have to go back in time for a moment and need to ask ourselves, how did this whole thing start? So how did we start in uh, computer technology with parallel hardware and how did the software deal with that? And in order to do that, we take a short jump into classical operating system topics or operating system history. And one example from the operating system history that relates to our current topic is batch processing. The IBM 1401 is one example. So this was one of the first general purpose computers in 1959. And this computer was able to take multiple punch cards, the input medium of that time, um, and process them in a so-called batch processing. So the idea there was that a computer cannot only um, deal with one program um, at a time, but is able to take multiple programs as an input and run them one after each other. This batch processing approach was a nice novel idea because it actually allowed, to, um, uh, allowed the users and the administrators to avoid some gaps in the usage of these very expensive systems. And in order to implement that, um, the software needed a new concept which was called a monitor. This monitor program was the one that coordinated the different input jobs from the cards. So the monitor star was started on the system, it took the first job ran it to completion, and then the program returned to the monitor and the monitor started the next job. This kind of batch processing um, can still be found in today's um, high performance computing world, but at that time it was actually the foundation for what we know today as an operating system scheduler. The reason for this is that although batch processing was in place, um, there was still a problem with I.O. activities. I.O. at that time meant dealing with tapes or with punch card readers, and this took a very long time in comparison to the actual computation time. So the idea there was to use the time spent on waiting for external devices and external I.O. with computing something else. And this was the invention or the start of what we call today multi-programming or multitasking. So you have two programs or more programs and they are combined, so to say, interleaved on the same machine um, by using the waiting time of one program to actually perform some useful computation in the other program. You can see this on the slide in this visualization. So we have program A running for a time and then waiting for I.O. And at the moment where the program A starts to wait for I.O., the second program can start to run and also do some kind of useful computation. Um, 
the idea here from a computer science perspective is to actually maximize or improve the CPU utilization by sacrificing a little bit of memory that you need in order to have two programs at the same running in the system. The multi-programming idea was a relevant and um, crucial step. The second crucial step was um, an additional demand from the users at that time, which um, wanted to interact with their running jobs. So despite the batch processing approach, there was the problem of debugging um, running programs or seeing outputs while the program is running. And this was the time where the so-called time sharing or preemptive multitasking principle was invented. So now we had the situation that multiple programs were running on the machine, they were interleaved in the execution, and at the same time we got new concepts in order to allow the direct interaction with the running program. So we needed to um, minimize the response time for the single user and allow somehow different applications to run um, uh, or to have progress um, while the user is using the system literally at the same time. So this time sharing behavior where the applications are look like that they're as they were run at the same time is what we have as the default behavior in today's system. So everybody is used to the fact that in my operating system I have multiple applications running at the same time and this is an assumption from the user perspective. So the user assumes that the system acts like this and behaves like this. And this kind of model where users see applications making progress at the same time is what we call in computer science concurrency. So the definition of concurrency is that you have a system which is capable of having multiple activities in progress. Multiple things step forward, they um, do their computations, they do their I.O. So they're getting progress in order to finish at a future point in time. And um, these different activities you have in a concurrent system may have a different pace. Yes, some of them may be slower, some of them may be faster. And this concurrency we get in such a system can then be um, done or executed or implemented by one or multiple processing elements, for example, cores or processors. So the idea of concurrency is that you have a view on the behavior of the system, and this is then implemented by the operating system regardless of the underlying hardware, either if we have only one processor or one core, or if we have multiple cores or processors, we get the notion of concurrency in our software system. In order to implement this, we need classical operating system mechanisms such as scheduling, um, which plans the next task that should be run, um, the dispatching on the particular processing elements, and often synchronization, what we will talk about in the following week. In comparison to concurrency, we have the concept of parallelism. And parallelism means that we have a system that is capable of running activities at the same time, simultaneously. So we need, in order to do that, we need some kind of parallel hardware which actually allows us to run these activities at exactly the same point in time. And we also need concurrency support in most cases. Um, historically, parallelism was an idea that mainly related to shared nothing systems, but as we all know, meanwhile, this is a term that is also relevant in shared memory world. So let's take different examples and ways of, um, of looking on the problem in order to sharpen these terms. Um, here's one example when we take the three interesting terms in this world, concurrency versus parallelism versus distribution, we could take um, the example of a single application, and this application is defining two tasks. And these, the definition of the two tasks in program code, for example, by writing different functions, creating different threads, or other ways of doing that, this is what we call a specification of concurrency in the code. And this concurrent code may be executed in parallel in the moment where we have parallel execution resources, meaning parallel hardware, available. Um, the next step then could be that we take these tasks and distribute them over different machines, which is then the uh, move to the shared nothing world. The management of concurrency or concurrent activities is a classical task of the operating system. So the notion of having multiple applications executing at the same time is a classical task. We get that from the OS. And the question is now, how do we express concurrency in the programming language and the software? Um, in order, when we go a little bit deeper and ask ourselves what is the real relation between concurrency and parallelism, then the main point is really that concurrency means that you deal with several things in progress. 
you make no promise about how they're executed and how the execution speed is. You only declare that they run um, at the same time or that they have progress um, at the same time frame. Parallelism is really a thing where you do stuff, where you execute stuff. And if you take this understanding and notion, which is the most common one in literature and in the community, then you could come to the conclusion that um, parallel programming is actually a misnomer because what you do in parallel programming is actually concurrent programming. You write a concurrent program and the difference to classical concurrent programming is that you now consider the fact that this concurrent program will eventually run on parallel hardware. So when we look into parallel programming, which is the intention of this course, we actually have to look into concurrent programming and have to understand what are the problems there, what are the main issues there. And if we got them, we solve a lot of issues that we will see in parallel programming because this is actually the classical concurrent approach plus the consideration of speed up um, through parallel hardware. Um, with this kind of understanding, you could come down to the conclusion that also any parallel software is concurrent software. Um, from our understanding, this is what most practitioners agree upon. While there are some researchers actually having a counter opinion, you will find the according material in the optional readings uh, for this unit. Concurrent software is not always parallel software, as you hopefully know meanwhile. So we can have the situation that software tries to run concurrently in order to optimize some performance characteristic, but this not, does, does not mean automatically that this software is prepared or designed to run on parallel hardware. Let's take a simple example in order to strengthen this understanding. Um, we take the example of a server system. So we have a server computer with one or multiple cores, and the server also has some storage, and we have clients sending requests to the server. The first example we see here is the case without concurrency and without parallelism. So the client sends a request, which is called A in this picture, and this request is received by one of the cores of the processing elements of the server. The server now performs some kind of computation. After the computation, for example, the parsing of the input data from the network, um, a request to storage is made in order to fetch the necessary data. Um, this takes some time, then um, an answer comes back from the storage system. Um, the core now again has to deal with the data, formulate an answer of network package, and sends it back to the client. If you want to have a practical example, this could be the case of a web server or of a database server, for example. In this example here, you see that we have a clear distinction between the phase of computation and the phase of I.O. on the storage system. So in this phase where the storage system is active, the core actually has nothing to do. The first idea we could use now is the idea of concurrency. So here we can use concurrency for throughput by now supporting multiple clients at the same time, even though the server system still has only one core and storage. You see in this picture that the first client is sending request A, while the second client is sending request B. And due to the fact that the um, request A is still in the phase where storage data is read, um, the core can now spend this waiting time for the first uh, A request to actually deal with the new incoming request. So what you get here is some kind of interleaving um, of the different request processings using the fact that in between the actual computations there is some time where you wait for, for the I.O. system, for the storage system, and in this time you can do some other work. Driving this example further, we can now ask ourselves what happens if we add another core to the system. So if the server system now gets two cores and we still have our two clients, we can now um, use parallel processing of requests because um, we have, we have a similar situation as before where the cores first spend uh, time on the processing of the incoming data and then ask the storage. But now we can even start to process the B request while the first request is still computed on core one. You see this in the picture by the overlap. So the message here is that the parallelism results from the fact that we take our concurrent software and now we add parallel hardware. And these parallel processing elements are now useful in order to parallelize the request processing um, on the given hardware pieces. So the overall effect here would be that hopefully the throughput of the system, the number of requests per time unit, um, gets even better. And the last possibility you can have with parallel hardware then is to use the parallelism for speed up. 
Speed up means that you not uh, only try to increase the number of requests per time unit of throughput, but you also try to increase the response time per client. And this is something you can do um, by parallelizing the computational part of the request processing on the given parallel hardware. So you see in the picture that we get the request A and then we split up the work for the initial processing between the two cores. We fetch the data, we again use multiple cores for formulating the answer and then return the result. One example for such system would be a parallel database system where the actual processing of the data is parallelized between multiple processing elements. You see different interesting points here, for example, the question, is this really something where you get speed up in comparison to the non-parallelized part? This is, according to Amdat's law, a question you always have to ask yourself. So in sum, what we have in parallel programming is the situation that parallel programming actually means concurrent programming plus the consideration of um, execution on parallel hardware. So in this week, we therefore need to deal with the question what is concurrent programming, what are the major principles there, and how do they influence the way we write parallel programs.